Well, hello and welcome to Victorious Faith. It is so good to be with you again today. You know, even as we were <laughs> sitting here and doing the countdown to ready to start the broadcast, I just have a, a soberness that has come up in my spirit and just the times that we're living in. And going back to the beginning of these messages, one of the things that that we covered uh, was that the Lord expects us to be discerning. We need to be discerning. Uh, the word talks about don't be unwise, but wise, understanding the will of the Lord. You know, years ago, and this was before, you know, when I started, when Lynn and I first became senior pastors was 1987, January. <clears throat> what I'm about to share with you, I don't share as an excuse or or anything other than just kind of factual. We had not had good leadership modeled for us. Good management was not modeled for us. So that's why I argued with the Lord. And yet now when I look back, I thank God that we just obeyed the Lord. But we're, we're talking about discerning the times. And in particular this week about you have to make a decision to never quit. And if I had not made that ironclad decision, because it stretched me beyond the norm, beyond my comfort uh, zone. It stretched me beyond my current limits. Bottom line is that's the only way you're ever going to grow is if you get stretched. And so back in the day that we started, I went back and checked this. There, there was basically leadership and management were used interchangeably. Today, there's a very distinct difference between managing a company and leading a company. And because of the world that we live in, the cutting edge technology, competition, challenges of the day, you have to know the difference now. It, it, it won't work. What used to work back in the 80s doesn't work today. It, there was uh, actually a principle that what got us here won't get us where we need to go. It's, it's great that whatever we had before got us to this point, but there's always that need to grow. So at any rate, we didn't have that modeled, so we, we had to begin to learn things, you know, simple things like, um, you know, we would have job descriptions for, for staff and things like that, but there was a different mindset, and I'll never forget that we had particular employees, they were a husband and wife team, and they were so faithful in church. I mean, they were at every event, every work day, every extracurricular activity, because they had a dream to want to be on staff. And then guess what happened? Once they got on staff, everything changed. They wouldn't show up for this, that, the other. And uh, I remember one day I just finally had to bring him in and I brought the husband in and I said, what is going on? I said, da, 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 da. And we had given them a job description. They knew and he goes, well, we didn't understand that, and we didn't know that. And I looked at him, and I said, whose responsibility is it to understand their own job description other than you? <laughs> and he said, well, I didn't understand it. I said, well, you should have come to me for clarity if you did. And we ended up having to let them go. Uh, there was some real wrong motives and, and just horrible attitudes and things like that. So the reason I say that, picture that, that someday we're going to all stand before the Lord and just like I shared in a previous message, a friend of mine failed his whole college course because he had the wrong assignment. He, he was working on the wrong assignment. He thought he was supposed to do one thing, and the professor said, that wasn't your assignment. It's our responsibility to get the clarity from the Lord. And that's basically what we find with the five foolish virgins uh, when we were reading out of Matthew chapter 25. They, they acknowledge Jesus as Lord. Lord, Lord, open to us. We're ready to come in. And he said, I don't know who you are. So here's the thing. They thought they knew him. But the, the question is not, do we know the Lord or know who he is or know about him? The question is, does he know us? So as I had shared that Andre Bronkhorst had challenged us three things to guard against, spiritual bankruptcy, health bankruptcy, and financial bankruptcy. So I want to talk to you today about the second one, health bankruptcy. And this is very critical. 
this is very key. Um, you know, my wife and I, were a part of a wellness group. I, I say a wellness group. It's a medical clinic, but it's not just medical. It's holistic. It, it really has to do with what I call 360 degrees of our health. So I was in recently and having some things done and learning some more things. But the bottom line of it is we have to understand our health is our first wealth. I could sit here and name pastor friend, preacher friend, evangelist friend, teacher in the body of Christ, minister, one right after the other that I have been friend I had been friends with for years, and they're in heaven prematurely because they they didn't take care of their health. And in many cases, the majority, like in the 90% range, totally 100% preventable. And one of the things that I found, I don't know how you do with this, but I, I typically, we take for granted our health until all of a sudden there's a hiccup in it or all of a sudden something happens to us or we get a bad report. And, and I've had it happen with me personally before that because I didn't take care of my health or because I didn't follow God's prescribed method for health, one of them was taking a Sabbath day. You know, it's it's not a, I like to say it this way, it's not a suggestion from the Lord that we take a Sabbath, a day off, a day of rest. It's a command. And I tell people, you know, God took a day off for you to not take a day off. What pride and presumption to think you're above God on that. Now, somebody would say, well, I don't think that, but your actions can show that. And I proved that. And I hit a wall many years ago, uh, and it was in an area of adrenaline and stress. And I got a hold of a book. In fact, I just gave one away yesterday. <laughs> I buy them about 10 at a time and I keep them in the office because I have friends that I run into that are type A personalities and I'll give them that book. And I would never read that book except for this. I hit a wall and it knocked me down and I couldn't just get up and power through it and go on. And so Andre Bronkhorst, you know, he's a very strong prophetic gift, one of the strongest I know. And he brought those three things, spiritual bankruptcy, guard against that. It's up to you and I to guard our spiritual lives. Paul told Timothy, you have to stir up the gift that's on the inside of you that God put in you. The second one, the health bankruptcy, to take care of your health and, you know, that's a constant challenge in the world that we live in with all the toxins, with all of the processed food and refined foods and all sorts of garbage they're putting in them and things like that. And I'm not saying you have to go on some kind of crazy this, that, or the other, but I do believe that we all need to understand and trust me on this. I'm in what I call my third semester of life. And so Lester Summerall basically told me this. He said, Mark, there's, there's basically three semesters to life now. That's my verbiage. But this is what he said, 30, 60, 90, and beyond. And so what you have, the first 30 years of your life, you're taking everything in. The second 30 years, between the years 30 to 60, roughly, this is not a precise thing that you go by the calendar, but roughly 30 to 60 are your building years. You take what you learned, you're working it out into your life. I think of our spiritual lives where we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. But then Dr. Sumrall was talking to me that one day about 60 and beyond, you know, like we think of 60 to 90. I'm in my third semester right now. And the first off, I, it's it's almost difficult to grasp that I'm in that third semester. It seemed like yesterday I was in my 30s. I was in my 40s. And now here I am in the third semester. But here's the key. And we're discovering this at Church for All Nations at CFAN. We have a group called Vintage Prime, and it's 55 and older. And that is the richest group in our church. They have survived so much. They have experienced hardship, difficulties. And yet, 
in society that we live in today, they say, oh, you hit your 60s. Well, it's time to retire. Pull the plug. Get your rocking chair out and go spend a lot more time rocking on the porch or get you an RV and drive across the country. And all of that may be something you do, and it can be very blessed. But your richest years of life, I believe, are the third semester. And I believe if we stay on course with the Lord, the third semester of life, the fruit that you bear the things that you impart will far exceed the previous two semesters of your life. You know, Lester Summerall was in his 80s when he went to be with the Lord. I personally think he would have lived longer except his wife preceded him in death. And there were things that he said that he just wasn't the same after she had left. And uh, he felt like he wouldn't be complete and whole till he caught up with her in heaven. But I am so grateful that he didn't follow the course that so many people do. You know, they get 60 or 65. Well, I think I'm going to retire, and I think I'm going to do this. Most people don't realize that the current mindset in the body of Christ even and the world will cause health, your health, to go bankrupt because God has something for you to do until the day you draw your last breath. Now, you may change what you're currently doing right now. You know, you spent 30 years at your company, 25 years, 40 years at your company, whatever. And yeah, there'll come a day that you leave that. But the most important thing is that you go to something because retirement is not a principle of the kingdom of God. There is no retirement in the kingdom. And I, I remember the day I found out, it was actually David Barton was teaching on a rabbi friend of theirs that they have, a Jewish man, and there were four English words that we use for which there are no Hebrew words. One of them is retirement. And it's a scriptural thing because the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. So one of the things I want to share is that the, the health bankruptcy can occur in several different ways. One, if you, if you have a destructive diet, uh, I'm thinking of a friend of mine right now. He called me four days before he went to be with the Lord. And it was the strangest phone, not the strange phone call, but it was interesting he just out of the clear blue said, you know, if I, uh, uh, what was it? He talked about, I, if I beat you to heaven, uh, he said, um, and, and then he shared a couple of things. And I said, well, brother, I said, I didn't expect uh, you to beat me to heaven. I said, I kind of thought we were going to go about the same time because our age gaps weren't that far apart. And four days later, he did go to be with the Lord. And 100% of his health problems were preventable. 100%. He had congestive heart failure. He had blood sugar through the roof that couldn't get under control, blood pressure through the roof, and his heart just finally gave out completely. And and from the time I known him, I remember I would sit, one time I sat in front of the hotel, dropping him off at the hotel. He was speaking for us. This is a long time ago, long before this happened. And I talked to him about his health, and I said, man, you need to be around for your children, your grandchildren, your ministry, and all that kind of stuff. And he sat there, and he said, you know, the Lord's talking through you. He said, I know death is stalking me. And it's, well, it's stalking all of us. There's a time and season for everything. But you don't want to go bankrupt in your health because that is your first wealth. And all it would have taken was some adjustment. He was addicted to sugar. You didn't have to worry about any of the other worldly things that, that trap people, but boy, that sugar thing. And, and sugar is more addictive than heroin, they say. And so the bottom line of it is we have to watch over our health because they'll come a day. Now, you may be young and your health is great and good. I remember when I was younger, I could eat like a garbage disposal, just eat anything and burn it all up. And, and it, you know, I could get away with all of the sweets and the starches and all that kind of stuff, but it, it's had to change. And so we guard against that. And then the third and final thing, because we're talking about discerning the times that we're living in, financial bankruptcy. You know, we need to keep an eye on our finances and not find ourselves where the enemy 
you know, all of this. In fact, we're going to go over to the parable of the talents now. And I want you to, you can look with me in verse 16. So the talents that Jesus gave right at the parable of the talents, right after the parable of the virgins, it talent was not being able to play the guitar, sing, or do some something in the church or the ministry that you're working with or whatever. It was a measure of money. And this was a great deal of money. It was $384,000 per talent, according to one of my old Thomas Nelson books. But basically, the Lord put these deposits in these three different people. One got five talents, one got two talents, and one got one talent. And then the rich man went away and he said, now occupy till I come back. And the word occupy simply means to go and do business, to trade, to invest, to watch over your investment, to get a return on it. And then here's where we pick up in verse 16. It said, then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, made another five talents. That's really good. Doubled his money. Verse 17, likewise, he had received two talents, gained two more. Verse 18, but he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant to the five that had doubled to 10. He said, well done, good and faithful servant to the one that had the two and doubled those. But then he got to this guy that hid his talent. Now, I'm going to tie these two things together because money and how you handle it is so critical. Um, believe it or not, the lack of money is not your problem right now. And, and that could be, let's say you're running behind or you have no money. It's how we handle what we do have. One of the talents that Jesus gave was the, the foolish steward or manager where he had been put in charge of a business and got himself in trouble. And then all of a sudden it came time to settle the accounts and the company was bankrupt. And so one of the correlations you'll see is money is a training ground for greater spiritual things. And so basically, you remember this in Luke chapter 18, where where basically the man said, get all the books together and I'm going to come. We're going we're gonna to go over everything. It's time to settle accounts. And what it's really talking about is at the end of our lives, the Lord is going to settle accounts to see what, he's, what we've done with what he's invested in us. And so all of a sudden, this man over in Luke chapter 18 said, he said, uh-oh, my boss is coming. He said, I'm too old to go out and start working and digging ditches. Uh, I'm ashamed to beg and to borrow. So I need to use what little time I have left. And he said, I'll go out and I'll make friends through the unrighteous mammon. Now, when I would read that, I thought, what in the world is he talking about there? And it's how we handle our finances because God wants every one of us blessed financially. But what we don't realize, financial accountability in our own personal life is the training ground to greater spiritual things. So what this guy did over in Luke's gospel was he went out and he said, how much do you owe my master? And he said, well, I owe this much wheat, this much oil. And he basically did a debt reduction and said, well, you pay this amount and I'll stamp it paid in full. And so he started making friends because while he still had an opportunity, that is while we're in this life, we still have an opportunity to use what God has given us, invest wisely, and make to ourselves friends through the proper use of money. So a couple of things on financial bankruptcy. I believe that God has given us a covenant assurance that we can be financially sound and secure. You know, when when I go back to the very first uh, month that Linda and I were set in as senior pastors, that was uh, January of 1987, we were running a deficit financially in this church, and um, 
we had bills we didn't know about. We had uh, judgments that were brought against us from the previous administrations. We had threatening lawsuits. We had all this insanity going on. And basically, it was a year and ten, uh, about a year and 10 months before we had a breakthrough. And how the breakthrough occur through the grace of God. That's how it occurred <laughs> because I wanted to give to world missions, but here I had creditors threatening to come and uh, confiscate our offering, if you can believe that. And I didn't believe that at first until I checked with our attorney. And uh, technically, according to a particular lease that had been signed, it could have been done. So guess how we got out of debt? It wasn't and how we got out of our financial thing. It wasn't that somebody just dropped a bunch of money on us and then all of a sudden we took care of everything and brought everything in order. It took a year and 10 months. Lester Summerall had come in August of 1988. So we go to Israel in November of 1988 and we're over there and he started talking about what the Lord had spoken and that those that partnered with him and would begin to sow seed into it, the Lord said he would release blessing upon them. The businessman that had sent Linda and I and paid all of our expenses was there in that meeting with his wife, leaned over to me and said, I don't understand why, but the Lord said to give $1,000 to the church so the church can sow $1,000 into that ministry. And I said, well, that sounds easy enough, exciting to me. And we did just that. And what I didn't know at the time was that was fulfilling a principle that when we don't have seed to sow, God will supply seed to the sower. And we got back and we mailed that $1,000 check in. And then all of a sudden, it wasn't very long after that, a man in our church came up and had a breakthrough. And his tithe check was $10,000. He handed it to me after church. Now, at that time, that was bigger than our whole offering back then. And here's what I'm getting toward, because financial bankruptcy, even though you may be blessed financially, there is coming a time in this earth that money can fail. It can potentially fail. And basically, that happened in the Old Testament Back in Joseph's time, when money failed in the land of Egypt. And so we've got to be careful that we are plugged into God's economy. And how are you plugged into God's economy? You plug in through sowing and reaping. Uh, we have been so blessed in America that we have we have had the residual blessing of the blessing of the Lord over this nation. And our economy, even its challenge right now, we've got inflation going on right now. You go to the grocery store and $100 doesn't buy what $100 used to buy. You go to the gas pump and it doesn't put as much gas in your car. We're in a real dangerous and critical time right now. We've got to guard against financial bankruptcy, but we've got to be careful that it's not just in this natural world system, but we're plugged into God's system. And the way that we do that is be involved in the harvest. I want to close with a story here. There's a great man of God. He's gone on to be with the Lord, one of the greatest pastors this nation ever had. He was involved in, in missions, and a, and a missionary friend of mine was close with him. And he told this friend of mine one day, he said, there's money set aside for the harvest that will never come into your hands until you get involved with the harvest. And that's why at Church for All Nations, my highest priority is making sure that we are a part of the Great Commission, that we are involved in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we teach that in our growth track here in uh, Church for All Nations. We teach what the Great Commission is. Most churches in America, and that's a big statement, are not involved in the Great Commission. They're doing a lot of good things but they're in danger of financial bankruptcy, even if they're doing good financially, 
if they get into a place and if we get into a place in this nation that money fails. Now, I'm trusting it won't. And I believe we can have an impact on the economy. I believe that the body of Christ is the saving grace to America right now. It's not the Democrats, the Republicans. They're deficits. Most of them are deficits to our country right now. Until we get back to the things of God and begin to align ourselves with his kingdom and get back to the purpose that God had raised up this great nation for and get involved in world harvest, finishing the Great Commission, getting to the place where the Great Commission becomes the great completion, then we're, we're, we're in grave danger. So those three things that uh, our dear friend uh, and brother in Christ, Andre Bronkhorst, shared, Guard against spiritual bankruptcy, guard against health bankruptcy, and guard against financial bankruptcy. All three of those things are our responsibilities. We're responsible for our own spiritual health. We're responsible for our own uh, health in our physical body. And then finally, financial bankruptcy, not just having things in the natural taking care of retirement and things like that, but making sure you're tied into the harvest through the giving of tithes and offerings and, and obeying the Lord and what he has said in his word. Let me pray over us today. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for the quickening of the Holy Spirit in every life. I pray, Lord, the things that you have quickened, we will give the more earnest heed that we will not let these things slip, but that we'll lay hold of them, that we will discern the times and the seasons that we're living in. Lord, you said your sheep, hear your voice. I decree and declare that we are your sheep and we hear your voice. In the voice of a stranger, we will not follow. We will be diligent and we will follow hard after you. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us on today's broadcast. What a powerful teaching. Our hope is that you were strengthened by today's message. But more than just hearing a great message, we hope that you sense the Lord speaking clearly and specifically to you. James 1 talks about us being doers of the word and not just hearers. So I wanna encourage you to take a moment and to ask the Lord, what are my next steps? One thing we hear Pastor Mark say all the time is the value and importance of reading, studying, and meditating on the word of God, as well as implementing prayer in our daily lives. As you do that, we know that you will grow tremendously. Before you go, we want you to know that we have a free devotional download to go along with this series. This has been prepared for you so that you can dig deeper as you receive fresh revelation, grow in your faith, and experience wonderful breakthrough in your life. 